is this working? Yes, I can hear it's working. Now it's time to continue. It's, it is a bit warm, uh, so I know you might be a bit tired, but we will have an interesting talk ahead of us. Our next keynote speaker is Dr. Johannes Vogel, who is the Director General of the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin and Professor for Biodiversity and Public Science at the Humboldt University Berlin. Uh, I have learned to know Johannes as the chair of the Open Science Policy Platform and uh, he will be talking a bit about um, OSPP as well as uh, our, on uh, citizen science. He's also the chair of the European Citizen Science Association. Uh, so um, the topic of his theme or the title of the, his theme is Innovation with Participation why we need open science. Johannes, the floor is yours. Um, hello. Thank you very much, Christina, for these kind words. Yes, I would like to talk to you about why from um, a biologist's point of view, um, we not just need libraries, but perhaps also uh, in my opinion, a very different approach to science and why you, with your excellent um, roadmap here and um, strategy, are already really addressing some of these issues. So congratulations and also, while I have not been following your program, I've read through it and you're really going to the heart of some of the issues that we now need to address. Science in general and I will follow up on this theme a bit, has become far too accustomed to certain ways of doing things. And I think they need disruption urgently. And it would be very interesting to then have a discussion whether some of you agree with that. Because I think we are facing a number of crises um, that need to be addressed, including, um, and I think that is one of the most challenging for me, a huge crisis in innovation. So, um, because innovation is um, not seen as a team sport, that, that would be my, my thesis. So let's see whether I can convince you that that might be an idea. So if you want to learn about biodiversity, natural history museums are obviously a good place to be, only second to nature itself, um, but that is how we try to pull it all together and in a way that is sort of a library of life. So um, if we look at nature, um, we have a slight issue in that um, over the last 500 years, and now we have an issue with the presentation. Can anybody tell me how I can make this picture proper? Yeah, well, somebody used the PDF. Oh, it works like this. Good, fantastic. Okay. Um, so... Here you can see um, what we've done to our world um, in the last 500 years. So when Luther, and I'm a good Protestant, so when Luther nailed his theses to the wall, the world was a bit like Eden, and now um, we've um, squandered um, quite a lot of it. The scary bit about it is the yellow bit, because that is land that cannot be reclaimed, and that with us um, adding another 50% um, adding another 50% um, on the human uh, population. So uh, good riddance to us if it continues like that. Um, the reason why I've chosen 1809 is that it's the birth year of, um, of my hero, Charles Darwin. So it's always a good point and place to start with him. Um, but it's not just, and again, this might be something that perhaps not you as research libraries, but libraries in general, um, see some evidence of, um, it's not just that we change nature, we're also changing us as a population, as a species itself. So what you see here is how the level of people over 60 is going to expand between now and uh, 2050, that is from the green to the blue, and if you look at the, if you can see the countries, it's all over the world. We've turned into a 
urban species in 2005 or 2007. Um, nobody really knows, but ever since, uh, for the last 10 years at least, we have become an urban species after sort of two million years out in the wild, out in the bush. Um, and as you can see, people will and are already living in cities. That's the percentage of people living in cities all over the world in orange. So we've changed nature. We are changing ourselves. The biggest crisis, however, I think is in this slide and in the next. And that is that we think that we are doing so well um, using modern technology or creating modern technology like, for example, computers or iPads and so on and so forth. Um, but it may all be fake in that, and this is quite a significant piece of uh, scholarship, and the citation comes in the next slide. They actually say that all the innovations that really made our life worth living have already all happened um, around here. So when you wake up in the morning, you may want to ask yourself what is more important to you. Is it that you have some drinking water that you can get out of the tap or the um, Twitter feed from Mr. Trump? What is more important to you, your iPad or your glass of clean drinking water? And all of that, of course, um, has happened um, here. There are some inventions in medicine, of course, that has happened in the last hundred years and continue to happen, but um, as far as infrastructure and perhaps sort of um, urbanization and living standards go, um, it may all have happened. And from a biological point of view, it's actually quite funny that um, for the last two million years, all we do to create energy is boiling water. And we think that we are really smart, um, not changing that way of life. So um, the thing is, we are probably just here and we are looking into nowhere. But the real reason why I show you this slide is that I'm one of the three, or was one of the three experts worldwide on the sex life of ferns. And as you can see, that is carrying the world. So this has to be in any of my talks. But now, um, but now comes, comes the real interesting bit. This is um, a very detailed study on um, the rise and fall of American growth. And you can see the political um, ramifications of this um, 2012 publication already emerging on the world stage. And the story goes that um, in the Middle Ages, we had a very, very per year growth rate of 0.25 or 0.2%. Then with the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, it shot up more than tenfold, probably peaked here just after the Second World War with a lot of uh, mili military industrial complex driving um, things forward. And this is the trajectory where we are now. And um, we may be actually going back to the past by 2010 um, at the same time when we have to cope with about 50% um, more humans on this planet. So in a way, the way how we've done it here and how we are doing it here might not be the right way to go forward. At the same time, we have a very elaborate, very sophisticated machinery or system called science and its establishment um, which is perpetuating the myth that they know how innovation works, that they are basically the standard bearers of innovation and thereby human progress. So, um, interesting thing, I would say. Um, there is also a study on the history of innovation. And this also doesn't make particularly nice reading. A. Um, the Industrial Revolution, if you study that, this historian of science concludes is that the modern stagnation um, in innovation seemed to have no easy cure. But now I think, and this is where we now come to libraries and other places, it seems to be that the kind of institution that foster and stimulate innovation and progress and intellectual innovation 
are perhaps not easily identifiable. Some people claim that they know where it happens, but this study says that may not necessarily be so. And this then means where can we create spaces where innovation might happen. And for me, innovation is not scientific innovation. For me, in this day and age, with the challenges we face, we are talking about how to bring science and society together for co-creation, working together in new ways. And there, of course, libraries, museums, these non-commercial places for community have to be, in my opinion, at the forefront of creating this type of space. We basically need to get innovation back out of the claws of the people who um, promise a lot, but perhaps not necessarily deliver. Do you know who that man is? Does anybody know who that man is? The father of the Industrial Revolution, or one of them? Josiah Wedgwood? He, just by coincidence, invented the first modern transport system in the UK, and um, with the canals, then really fostered um, industrial growth there and financed it with his pottery as well. Also, actually, he put up in today's money and his um, wife and daughter put up in today's money um, several billion to fight slavery. So uh, quite a modern thinking family they were. And they did not come out of a university. So for me, as a biologist, this is the mother of all innovations and everybody in this room is actually a product of these 3.8 billion years of continuous success because that is how long your ancestry goes back to whatever it was at that stage. But we are all sharing one thing, mainly DNA, and that has evolved as far as we know once, and we are all um, part of this evolutionary process and outcome. So this potentially is the mother of all innovations. Um, and one of the challenges that we face is how to use it smart. And now you might say, what type of innovations actually come from there. So here's one thing out of our collections, um, a nasty old shark with a um, quite interesting grin from the 18th century court off the coast of um, Australia. But what have sharks ever done for you other than giving you nightmares after watching Steven Spielberg movies? Um, they actually, um, at Natural History Museums are intimately involved in this, have allowed Damien Hirst um, to become um, one of the richest artists in modern time because how to pickle that thing he actually learned in a Natural History Museum. But now we are getting perhaps a bit closer. So here, if you want to win Olympic um, um, swimming competitions, these type of um, speedo shark skins might help you. And of course, for an aging population, very, very important. Um, shark antibodies might actually help to um, put substances in your brain that battle Alzheimer's. So um, the shark might actually really cure the demographic nightmare we are facing. So um, plenty of things to discover in all of this. At the same time, as you know, we are facing the sixth um, extinction crisis in um, the 4.5 million years of Earth's history. So plenty of things to do, and especially for biodiversity, but I would argue also for your field, um, a lot of new things are now coming together that help us to reimagine where we are, where we want to go, and how we can um, work. So for biodiversity, it's certainly collections, it's wildlife, um, it's people, it's science, and new emerging technologies. So with us connecting all the knowledge we have about species um, in new and interesting ways, using um, people who've never been in contact with natural history museums to explore these data in relation to their ambitions and drivers, um, but also potentially running AI over it um, might be quite an interesting way to look at the world afresh. Of course, that we have access to the universal code of life, DNA, helps a lot. And um, in a society where work is becoming more sparse, but meaning still needs to be provided, um, I think um, the engagement of citizens um, and doing this in an open fashion is a must. 
it will also help us as scientists actually to become better at what we are doing. So um, where do I see these themes now merging? I would argue we are looking at a lot of global challenges and certainly we want to live in a knowledge society that provides us with quite some wealth, um, good living conditions and so on and so forth, but for that we rely on science and technology. But that cannot be um, the holy grail any longer. We need more and more scientific and societal solutions and science needs to change, needs to learn to listen, to open up and accept that there is some um, yeah, co-production um, in the wings. Also, I would argue that, and I think we are seeing this um, quite uh, drastically now, um, democracy needs scientifically literate citizens. And um, in a way, citizen science might actually be one of the antidotes to populism. Um, however, um, let's see how it all works out. Um, Sheila Jasinov, one of the cleverest um, sociologists of science, has come up with this wonderful phrase that for the 21st century, the strapline is no innovation without participation. And I think scientists haven't really heard that cry yet, other than um, when their funding gets cut by populist presidents. Um, so um, we have new ways of communication that can be used for good or evil. I think we all know that now. Um, anyway, my experience um, being engaged in citizen science for a long time now is that if one finds the right way as a scientist, um, citizens want to be engaged. So what does the EU do? Of course, they haven't worked as many wonders yet as our lonely shark in the museum, but they're also quite good at what they are doing. So they picked up quite early on um, on some of the themes that were emerging and where you are also intimate part of, like for example, the whole issue of open access. They looked at what the EU can do to foster a more open science environment for the European research area. And they said, deep change has to be the guiding principle. There needs to be a process of concerted action and it needs to be an inclusive process of all stakeholders um, to drive forward this need for change. And so that then meant that people like Paul Ayres or, or Christina and I met um, at these various fora and then eventually found ourselves in the European Open Science Policy platform. And straightforward, if you are funded publicly, you better make your data and your information publicly available. So the drivers, the aims of the open science policy, what we in the platform now addressed in the last two years was how to foster open science, how to remove barriers, develop research and infrastructures, and for infrastructures, of course, US libraries are vitally important, how to start mainstreaming open science, and how to embed open science in society. And all of us can play a role in this, not just through thinking or through writing these wonderful documents. You are actually, I would argue, one of the leading um, organizations in this, in this change. Um, but it all needs to be implemented. And that, I think, is something that we will have to grapple with for the years to come. So if we want to look at this systemically, here you can see the things that need to be addressed in part simultaneously, which in a well-functioning, well-oiled um, system like science in Europe is a very, very hard thing to do because as long as money is coming, people very, very rarely feel the need for change. So how, for example, do you want to change the reward system for scientists that want to make a career but still being measured by outdated, perhaps, metrics? and so on and so forth. So you can see it here that a lot of things um, need to be addressed and changed. And we also, in particular, I would argue, need, and I'm pleased to learn that you are actually doing this already, we need change leaders. And these need to be trained, these need to be educated, these need to be empowered, these need to be cared for by the community. And you are doing this already for your 
libraries and library leaders of the future, and I can really only congratulate you on going that way, because all of this change can only be implemented if people um, who are leading organizations um, want this to happen. So here you see the Modley crew of the um, Open Science Policy Platform. Um, we now had uh, the first two years, and in that year, a lot of work was done, and the best thing was really that we've managed um, in time to deliver a um, policy paper for the EU Commission that went in front of the Intergovernmental Competitiveness Council, which is constituted of all the science ministers of the various member states, and they all adopted this policy paper that you can see on the OSPP website um, in May, 29th of May. So that means that what is in this document will not just guide what may be coming forward in the NINES framework, but it also will have to start being implemented by the member states. And in the member states, I think the resistance will be a bit higher, which is completely understandable. But again, organizations, sectors that want to drive forward change in the science system, then need to stand up and work with their colleagues and friends within their national states to drive forward some of these agendas. So there's plenty of work that now needs to be done. And that uh, policy framework paper, which I think you've also already in part adopted in your own documents here, because Christina is a fantastic interloker and uh, translator of these things, um, intellectual translator, I mean, um, um, has already uh, worked here with you. So where are we now? Open science will be science-driven, technology-driven, but it has also to be bottom-up citizen-driven. There needs to be one shared agenda, and as the EU did, it's always smart to bring the different agendas and actors together and let it work, out, work them it out together. And that's, I, I would argue, we've managed to achieve in the OSPP over the last two years. And they were all very highly committed, but in part also um, focused on their interest members, and that actually came to fantastic compromises. And the leader in all of this now seems to be the Netherlands, who have for a long time been a driver of open science, especially open access. I think you're all aware of that. But in their new coalition agreement, um, they've now displayed a lot of confidence in open science. Um, as you can see here, open science and open access has to become the norm in scientific research. And that is a very, very steep ask, but um, they um, have put up some interesting uh, targets. So op full open access of publications, publicly funded ones by 2020, um, make research data suited for reuse, recognition and rewards for researchers and proposals, promote and support open science. That is a lot of hard work, but they've organized themselves, so you have um, a good governance with the whole thing, and again, a member of the OSPP, uh, meaning Karel Leuven is now their national coordinator. So that is a really, really big step, and Karel is really committed personally to all of this, and with the um, governance structure, he should really move forward fairly rapidly on this. And I would argue that other nations may want to follow. Germany, as you know, <coughs> is a federal state, so that will be um, nearly impossible to get a national coordination. We not even monitor our biodiversity, let alone open science. So the um, federal system has advantages and disadvantages. So um, where are we in citizen science? And again, as I said, we need places where science and society can meet, and, again, and I would argue, as I said before, libraries, but also museums have to play a special role as trusted non-commercial places for community. So in citizen science, we have a stratification of engagement. You have a lot and lot of um, 
passive observers of science, that goes up to 50% in, in the Western world. Then people who are actively engaged, probably, if you can really push it, you will get to 8 or so percent. Um, this, the next level, is much, much smaller. That is co-production, eye-level working citizens and scientists, and then this in particular in the field of medicine is where the public actually wants certain bits of science delivered with rare diseases, for example. Um, they fund scientific research themselves as concerned um, citizens. So while this pyramid is perhaps a bit misleading because it has a huge bottom and a very, very, very small tip, um, the role of science, in my opinion, has to be um, to bring people from the level they are at into the next level. And that you can only do if you listen, if you hear what they want to achieve and how you as a scientist, you as a library, can help them to achieve the next level. Not by telling them what you want them to do, but to listen and to engage and to foster and to enable. And that is perhaps a bit alien to science as a whole. Um, where is it all going with citizen science in relation to being accepted as a new part of the science structure? Um, so publications acknowledging citizen contribution is going up very sharply. Um, but here you can also see that I should um, renew my figures. If you have any good figures on that, I would be very interested in that you're probably the place to find them. Um, the other thing which I find very interesting in the field of citizen science, and it may also be of interest to you, is that um, at least in the US, citizen science seems to break um, the way how science is funded. So it's not just the state um, who funds question-driven science um, in the US, but now 50% uh, of the money seems to be coming from other sources for citizen science. That it can become a double-edged sword, um, especially in the US, but it's interesting that the monopoly of science funding, at least in Germany, most science funding comes from the state and then um, from industry seems now to be um, cracking, which um, will get interesting dynamics into the system we have to at least be aware of and work with. So um, just one example, what a proper citizen science program can do. I used to live um, in the UK for 23 years, so this is um, one of the projects I was um, uh, deeply involved in. Um, it ran from 2007 onwards um, and just closed in the last few years. So in a very short period of time, in the first um, phase from 10 to 12, um, these are some of the figures that we were able to achieve by starting to listen to people in relation to the environment. So um, 850, that is a big number. This was an England-wide program. So we are actually talking about nearly 3% of the population um, or 2 to 3% of the population. Of those, 20% came from um, not privileged backgrounds, and then you can see how many schools and various other things are involved. But what I find the funniest of it all is, or an interesting measure of success, that it received the UK Government Civil Service Award for Reform. So um, listening to people and engaging in the civil service in UK gets you an award. Um, should have thought about that a bit earlier. Anyway, um, here we go. The other thing, and the same like you do, lots of policy agendas, lots of strategies um, from all the Western associations. They themselves link up to form a global association, so uh, very similar to what you do at the library level. Now, what we haven't achieved with the European Citizen Science Association is what you have achieved in, in um, LIBA, because we are only 28 countries. Christina told me you're 41 
41. So um, we have still a bit of catching up to do, but um, perhaps in a few years' time I can report that we've caught up. So plenty of organizations, um, not just in the science field, but also in other spheres of society getting involved. So now try to wrap up. As far as I can see, we need a new culture um, to address the global or the grand challenges. There are plenty of drivers that, in my opinion, force us not just that the environment is going down, um, but I would argue that society needs to be uh, restarted. Uh, so there, I would argue there are societal wants. There are definitely scientific needs. Science had a good run um, the way it did in the last 150 years. I think it needs to change. There are plenty of open minds about. Advances in technology and communication can only help this process if applied properly. And again, US libraries doing a fantastic job in doing so. Science, in my opinion, needs to find new ways of working, not just excellence, but also relevance. What, in my opinion, can we get out of all of this? Um, I think a livable planet, which is um, not a small thing to achieve. Um, I think um, a scientifically literate citizenry would be quite good because they could exercise some judgment um, or perhaps um, a more informed judgment um, when they go to the ballot box. We need dynamic adaptive societies because that is the principle of evolution and if it governs the world it certainly governs us. Open innovation would be smart because how do I as a curator of sharks, know what others can do with it. So it needs to be open. And a truly open science, I think, would be a major step forward. So innovation with participation then, in my opinion, would mean fostering a discourse, fostering listening, engaging, enabling, and reinventing. And I am an evolutionary a biologist, so there are a few things that have been deeply ingrained in my thinking. But interestingly enough, economics is catching up. And this is one of the sentences that apparently is applied to a capitalist system, that organizations need to think about themselves in terms of either deep change or slow death. And I would argue that we rather opt for deep change. Thank you very much for your attention. Johannes, thank you very much for your fantastic talk. Uh, I very much liked your images you, you used, so they are perhaps a bit unusual in our environment. And that reminded me that we once had a dinner at your museum, so we were sitting under the dinosaur. So it was something special because they, they sort of piled so, so high up. Okay, uh, so we have uh, our audience sitting in two auditoriums. So first of all, I'd like to ask people in auditorium B, would you have some questions to Johannes? Do you have any questions? I can't hear. No questions from auditorium B. No questions, so what about here? Would you have some, some questions? So Johannes was talking about innovation, OSPP, citizen science. Yes, good. Thank you. There's one. Hello. Um, I think uh, three weeks ago you Excuse were... Excuse me. C could you introduce yourself? Uh, sorry. My name is Thomas Karstedt. I'm from Denmark. Three weeks ago we were at the same ESCA conference, European Citizen Science Conference in Geneva. There were 420 participants and there were two librarians. And that was only because my colleague from Denmark was registered the wrong way, so I was actually the only librarian. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that uh, how do you see the library role in this culture change that you need, you feel an urgent need for? Uh, I heard Karen Cooper from uh, North Carolina said something like, libraries are all about coordination of knowledge and connecting researchers. So do you see any kind of role for libraries and what could it possibly be? Thank you. Um, as I tried to say, um, so I think society 
lacks spaces where it can convene in a non-commercial way. And libraries um, had that role of community building in the past. I mean, you as research libraries, perhaps not so much as libraries in general. And I think, and as far as I understand, in, in America, um, quite a number of libraries are reinventing themselves as community hubs, maker spaces, and so on and so forth. I think we are all becoming hybrid spaces, and um, especially you as libraries, um, guardians of um, human knowledge, um, can use technology and people interactions in new ways to foster community building around issues that matter to people. And um, I would argue <coughs> libraries, museums can learn a lot there, and we can also learn a lot actually from this really vibrant um, citizen science community that we both experienced in, um, in, uh, in Geneva. There's a lot of bottom-up energy in society now, um, and it would be good if they could find places like libraries or museums and make them their own. It would mean that we have to be open to the change they bring with them, but I think it would really invigorate us um, as at the same time. I would like to have a follow-up question for you, audience. So do we have somebody here who is actively working on citizen science? It would be very interesting to hear what you are doing. There's Paul. And there's an, yes. Paul Aris is there, could, could you, Paul is sitting there. And then we take the next one. Are you a good catcher? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm uh, Paul Aris, I'm Pro Vice Provost in uh, University College in London. As Johannes has said, I um, um, sit on the Open Science Policy uh, platform, uh, which he chairs. In my uh, university in London, we have got a very active citizen science project run uh, with uh, the library. Uh, we are the main um, holder of the manuscripts and archives of Jeremy Bentham, the 19th century utilitarian philosopher. Um, Bentham's the man who invented the word international. Um, he, he coined that in, at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, what we have done is to have all the uh, manuscripts and archives digitized with funding from the Mellon Project. Uh, and then um, we crowdsource the transcription so that we uh, allow citizens who are interested in 19th century studies, in philosophy, in Bentham, uh, in law, in economics, to transcribe uh, his handwriting. It's particularly difficult handwriting because he wasn't a very... Uh, careful writer. But we've had hundreds of uh, transcriptions made. Well, hundreds of, of, of transcribers, uh, thousands of transcriptions made, and they, the transcriptions come from the general public, from people engaging with the project. They go to the editorial board to be double-checked, and then they form part of the uh, collected works of Bentham which are being published. So that's a real example of how a library using special collections can uh, get really involved in citizen science. Thank you for that. And we take another example. It was from this side. <laughs> that way? I, I'm looking for a hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should I pass it on? It was it for me? It's OK. You, you take it, yes. Okay, I just had one question for you, because I really like to enjoy the presentation. I'm Dagny Baltinja. I'm from the National Library of Latvia. And um, I, I think it just really, really falls into the place with the current movement of degrowth, which even got the Nobel Prize. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit about this, because currently what we are experiencing also at the library is that we are constantly developing our data, developing all the technologies, developing IT. But when, you look, when we look back on the slide where you had the 19th century, which actually made the difference for living standards for whatever we consider ourselves to be humans now, I think it really, really comes together with the question of degrowth. And maybe you can just elaborate a little bit about it. The role of libraries in degrowth and I think this concept of slowing down, because I think it also falls together with the final dots you made in your presentation that basically we have to be with this bottom, the, this community which currently is very energetic about this. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best person to, to answer this. So my gut feeling is that if you constantly chase sort of the demon of progress, um, you're going nowhere. 
um, because it's false. Um, it leads you up the, the, wrong, the wrong path. Um, and if one were to slow down and listen to community and try to ask them what they need, what they want, or as Paul nicely described, what they can contribute, it might actually really help to find a new and sustainable focus instead of constantly trying like a hamster in a wheel um, to run oneself dead and dry. And um, that can only happen if one stops, reflects, listens to oneself, but also to others, and then tries to find a new way. But that is also um, one of the standard models of, of growth in leadership. So in a way, um, what you're actually describing is probably, in general, a lack of leadership um, and rather a lemming attitude, which is not helpful. Okay, so do we have some more questions, perhaps on some other aspects? Yes, one in the back, and then here one in the front. Okay, it's Wilma. I'm uh, Wilma van Wezenbeek. I was the writer of the National Plan Open Science of the Netherlands, so very nice that you uh, uh, mentioned it as a librarian, right? Well done. And um, I wondered, um, I of course also know Carl Luiben very well, he's from the Delft University, I'm a librarian there. But in the Open Science Policy Platform, do you also talk about open education as a topic that perhaps needs to be added um, on the agenda? We in Delft are definitely wanting wanting to go that road? Yes. Um, I don't know whether education falls in the remit of the EU, though. Um, probably not. It's probably um, um, a national state's um, legislation in the subsidiarity system. So therefore... That's the was, reason. Yeah, I think that might be the reason. Because the people, are, of course, are the same. Yeah, yeah, of course. The researchers, yeah, teachers. Yeah, yeah, but the EU, as far as I understand, always has to look what things it can take on and which it can't. And also, I would argue it's important that this framework um, gets passed so that a new frame can be set for it all and then bottom-up movements in the states. You see, the, the beauty of Europe, in my opinion, is that we have a system where um, different approaches can compete and we have an open space where people, um, products, services can migrate with open borders so therefore, if an education system is particularly good, and if it's based on open principles, then of course people will adopt it fairly rapidly. I understand Finland has completely changed its, its um, education mm -hmm. system um, lately to get a competitive advantage. And I think sort of the, the smaller countries like um, Netherlands, Finland, are much, much more adaptive and dynamic than um, other countries I don't it's want to easier. mention. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There was one question somewhere here. Yeah, okay. uh, hi, I'm Robin Rice from University of Edinburgh. Um, you got me thinking about the populism, and I'm from the US originally, but um, I was just wondering if you think that the scientific record, either <coughs> the way it's um, communicated now in scholarly publications or the way we're going with open science can can withstand um, uh, even more changes to that chart where you, science is privately funded and uh, groups get together and pick their issue and, 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 and get scientists to come up with results. I'm just thinking of what happened yeah. to the news with Fox yeah. News and we have alternative yeah. facts. Yeah. So um, I think that's a very, very good point. I can't give you an answer. I just put all of this up to basically <laughs> show what the breadth of approaches and possibilities are and so that we are aware of it and may want to think about how we want this to happen in the future and what we need to do to achieve the outcomes we wish to have and um, doing nothing is probably not the right approach so that's basically my plea be the drivers of the change you want to happen um, and that's we are all asked i think there's one question here in the front. 
Uh, hi, hello, uh, Miropushnik. Uh, I will put one very strange uh, question, but uh, I would like to hear because I, I thought many times about. We are talking about uh, open science, we are talking about uh, open education, open lectures, etc. What about open culture? Okay. Uh, because culture is also funded in many cases uh, on public means, so uh, what is your opinion about that? Yes. Um, I, I think we are coming into a, well, the principle I'm coming from is that um, while we all might think that we are really smart and have a certain monopoly of knowledge, um, we are never smart enough um, to see, not by a long margin, we are smart enough to see all the possibilities that are potentially in what we are producing in our daily lives, be it um, as a person in culture, as a person in science, and so on and so forth. So I would argue, um, as the world cries out for um, smart solutions, um, we better all operate open so that others can harness what we can't see. That would be uh, my approach. So are there some more questions at this side? There were quite many coming from that side of the auditorium, so from here <laughs> to be neutral and <laughs> well balanced. <laughs> Or in room B. <laughs> okay, any other questions? If not, we thank you very much. This has been very interesting. Thank you.